I'm sat here with uh, with Paul Cadden, who's um, a former University of Gloucester student, um, and also amongst other things, uh, a Buddhist. Um, now, we've talked in the past about your particular form of Buddhism you practice. I want to ask you something more general, really, more more personal in a way. Now, you've been a Buddhist for over 30 years, yes. um, living the vast majority of that time in the UK. When you tell people, however it comes in conversation, or you, people inquire that you're a practicing Buddhist, um, has that reaction that people have to that change over the last 30 years? Has it been kind of being a member of a minority religion, in that sense, in the UK? Uh, I'm not. I can't really tell how much it's changed insofar as that. It greatly depends on the person I'm encountering. Overall, though, I find that it's it's now never really a challenge to tell people that I'm a practicing Buddhist or a Buddhist because people are generally quite um, happy to know about that. They don't, they're not going to sort of edge away from me thinking, "Oh dear," or that I'm out after their soul. It's, that it's, the, it's not because do you think to some extent Buddhism has a relatively benign. Public image. Has, yeah, I don't think Buddhists are kind of scary. That could be one of the reasons. Another one is that people do profess an interest in Buddhism mainly because uh, most people have heard of it, and I'm sort of feeling I'd like to find out a bit more about it, but I've never got round to it. So, now I've met a Buddhist, I, I'll ask him questions as to what what, so what is it? So kind of socio-cultural positioning of Buddhism yes. is kind of important. But so you do find that last thing you said, you do find that when people find out that you're a Buddhist in conversation, that what comes next often is, oh, good, I've got a list of questions, or how, does that mean you live like this, or why isn't your head shaved? Well, or? yes, there is that. There can be um, that means you don't eat meat or, um, or fish, or, or and you and you are. Uh, yeah, I've never been um, challenged on the head shaving bit. That's most, my personal yeah. <laughs> Most people would immediately think, yes, a Buddhist is a person who, who wears saffron robes and shaved heads and lives yeah. in a monastery, but. But I think people not, uh, accept that uh, you can be a Buddhist and be an accountant, or a, yeah. in your <laughs> or case, a lawyer, yeah. in my case, or a, or um, or anything. A truck driver can be. Yeah. A, and but I imagine the Buddhist accountant society is quite small. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Well, there is a thing about it in Buddhism. One of, one of the sayings in Buddhism is that poor man will never get rich by counting a rich man's money, no matter how long he does it, night or day, yeah. unless you're. <laughs> I, I start on unless you're an accountant, where yeah. you can actually become richer. But um, but uh, yes, uh, it's uh, it's it's. I, I would like to think that Buddhism has a slot in every single situation that people find themselves. The Buddha mm-hmm. is is within everything, and that's yeah. that's uh, no matter how mundane. In, and another, another thing I used to la- enjoy thinking, although I'm not sure if my re- life is a reflection of this, is that Buddhism helps to change the mundane into the adventurous, and it shows the enlightenment in everything. Yeah, and that, I mean, I don't know don't get necessarily into the types of Buddhism, but yeah. that, um, although the kind of Buddhism that you're interested in is predominantly um, Nishrin Buddhism, that also is very evocative of the way that, for example, Zen Buddhism talks um, about the way that you can perceive a mundane item, mundane flower mm. or plant, both from a very kind of normal way, just a yeah. thing, um, to the way that you can see it actually is the unlocking of very, something very profound, the way mm. you kind of portray an art or through kind of um, Japanese cultural artifacts, the kind of um, poetry, is that you can turn the mundane into the, the means of articulating something very profound about human experience. Yes. Yes. Um, I... I it's easier to see that within human experience rather than watching, looking at something like probably a notebook on, on the table and thinking something's profound in that. But but every experience that a person goes through has within it the potential for enlightenment, no matter how bad or how good. Mm. In, in fact, um, although we, we would want to put in any form the fact that you have to be suffering in order to, to get enlightenment. Mm. But generally speaking, going through challenging situations which aren't necessarily defined as good good to begin with yeah. has more has probably pushes people more towards gro- growth in their lives for enlightenment. Mm. And good things happening to you probably does um, um, uh, uh, retard a bit your ability to grow. But, but but good things happening can be just as powerful in being able to understand your enlightened state. Mm. We could talk for hours about enlightened state, but yes, I think we're going to retreat from thinking about enlightenment. <laughs> At least for today, we'll yeah. do the enlightenment tomorrow. Um, so, people's response to you um, in terms of them being kind of benign, be curious. Yes. I think that probably yeah. characterizes yes, um, right. what you've talked about, uh, which is uh, important. I think what also um, people might be interested in finding out is to what extent is the forms of Buddhism that you're interested in and generally 
been interested in kind of missionary work, you know, spreading the message of Buddhism. Because we tend not to, in the West, often associate Buddhism mm. with the missionary zeal that we often um, think of when we think of Christianity. Yeah. Um, but historically, um, Buddhism's spread through a process of conversion as much as through migration. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, there is very much a missionary statement within mm. uh, most forms of Buddhism. I, th I think people don't regard Buddhism as a missionary, um, as missionary zeal, because the, their image of what Buddhism mm. is is they're supposed to be outside the everyday world. But uh, uh, yes, uh, um, telling people about Buddhism and allowing people to understand Buddhism is as important as practicing yeah. Buddhism yourself. Practicing for others, as we call it, is to be able to share the, the treasure of the Buddha's teaching with other people. Um, and so from your point of view, that would flow from this very strong emphasis in pretty much all forms of Buddhism on compassion, mm. on wanting to see other people yes. be less unhappy, more happy, you know, yes. to, kind of, yes. to kind of bring about a greater kind of happiness for people, individuals to reduce their suffering. And that combined with the belief that the practices that Buddhism entails do actually help people transform their experience of life to one which is more able to cope with, this word is very fashionable now, kind of resilience, but it helps people kind of deal with difficult situations in ways that are less harmful for them or kind of have less. So actually the missionary zeal is linked to, one might argue in Buddhism, a strong um, compassionate strand that runs through it. Yes, yeah. Um, when we say that the Buddha has three virtues, courage, wisdom and compassion. Mm. They are all interlinked. You can't you can't demonstrate one without the other. And compassion mm. is very important. Yeah. Compassion is probably the the challenging one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wisdom, wisdom is nebulous. You never really understand what's wise until after after the <laughs> result. And courage, of course, is um, well. Yeah, you need to um, challenge life in order to mm. um, show courage. But compassion is is the reflection we have towards other people and bringing out, hoping to bring out their wisdom, courage, and compassion. And that's difficult because not all people, you know, some people it's easy to be compassionate to, yeah. and other people who are well, less sympathetic, yeah. that's, but that can actually be quite... It's easy if you if you enjoy being in the company of everybody you encounter, mm. and you're with friends and everything. Yes, that, it's, that's easy that you it's easy to be compassionate to people you, you like and love, but to be compassionate to people who are more challenging in that area, who you feel, oh, I'd rather not be in this person's presence, I'd rather not be, spend too much time with this mm. person. That's that's where the challenge is, and that's that that is really the exercise of compassion. It's easy to be courageous if, if there's no um, if you're doing something that other people think is 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 fearfully adventurous, but you're it doesn't you're bother you at all. You're not scared. Well, there's no real courage there. Mm. You you're, you're showing courage. Obviously. You have to have a little bit bit of fear to to, to show courage, um, and and the same goes for compassion. I suppose that you to an extent you have to. Um, make the effort, make mm. the effort, expand yourself to embrace people of all sorts of people. Mm. And that is that is the Buddha's um, message, is to have that mm. sort of embrace of... Well, I think that, that um, kind of final point, I guess, that um, really brings home something about the, the intention of many forms of Buddhism, which obviously isn't always realised, but certainly the aspiration of many of them are for the Buddha's compassion to be kind of boundless and yes. expanding. And that you find yeah. that in Buddhist sex, those terms that... To kind of spread that out and to unfold it into yes. the world is really what I guess for many people it means to be a Buddhist. Yes, that's right. To have that um, um, desire to embrace the lives of other people, yeah. um, so that they're able to also aspire to do the desire same. to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get into any kind of horrible infinite regresses, thank you. Thank you very much. Dave.